This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can pre-order every card in this set review by going to cardkingdom.com slash needsahone or by following the link in the description. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's that time again, set review season. The full card gallery for the upcoming Brothers War went up earlier today, and that means I'll be bringing you a new set review video every day until the pre-release, which is November 11th. In these videos, I'll discuss how good I think these new cards are going to be in this new limited format. Today we're going to take a look at every single multicolored and colorless card in the set. This is a good place to start as the multicolored cards do a good job of introducing us to the set's major themes and archetypes. Multicolored cards also tend to be some of the most powerful in a set, and that's always fun. Tomorrow I'll give you my thoughts on all the white cards, blue cards a day after that, and so on. I use a letter grade system to sum up my thoughts on each of these cards, and if you aren't sure what those letter grades mean, check out the description where you'll find an explanation. A few reminders before we take a look at our first card. This review is about limited. That means draft and sealed, and that means I'm only going to be reviewing cards that appear in draft boosters. Also keep in mind that these are my feelings about these cards before actually playing the new format, and that means I'm definitely not going to be perfect in my predictions. After all, every format is different. As I play the format, I'll be providing updates about the format on the channel. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's dive into the review. First up, we have Arbalest Engineers, which for one generic, a red and a green is a 2-2 human artificer at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you choose one. It deals one damage to any target. You put a plus and plus one counter on target creature. It gains trample and haste until end of turn, or create a tapped Power Stone token. These are a big feature in this set. These are tokens that say, tap, add colorless. This mana can't be spent to cast a non-artifact spell. Something to remember there is that's a little more flexible than it might sound the first time you read it. You can use that mana to pay for anything that isn't a non-artifact spell, which means you can pay for things like activated abilities, including the unearth mechanic, which is in the set in addition to being able to spend it on artifacts, and there are lots of places to spend that mana in this set, as we'll see in this very video. So, red-green is a color pair interested in making power stones and playing big stompy creatures, and this card can help you do both of those things. The plus and plus one counter trample and haste option is definitely the most consistently powerful option. It has utility all game long, whether you put the counter on the engineers themselves to have them be a three mana three three with trample and haste, or if you put it on something else that's more imposing and can make better use of that in the later stages of the game. But obviously, if you can kill something with the one damage, including your opponent, or if you're really interested in ramping into something, and you might be, those options are there too. If it only had the middle option, this card would be at least a B-, minus. so adding the other two options easily makes this a B. Like most signpost uncommons we see these days, this is quite good. And by the way, when I say signpost uncommon, I mean an uncommon in the set that sort of tells you what a particular color pair is interested in doing in the set. Next up, we have Battery Bearer, which for two generic, a green and a blue, is a 3-4 human artificer at uncommon. Creatures you control have tap, add colorless. This mana can't be spent to cast a non-artifact spell. So, same thing as a Power Stone. And whenever you cast an artifact spell with mana value 6 or greater, you draw a card. This looks like a really strong signpost uncommon. They're all good in this set, don't get me wrong. This might be the best. Obviously, blue-green is about ramping into artifacts, including with those Power Stones, and the bearer comes with the ability to make all of your creatures Power Stone-like, which is very powerful in a format with lots of ways to spend that mana, and it even has a shot at drawing you some cards, which is awesome. It feels like this format has a perfect makeup for this card to really flourish. I think this is a B+. Next up we have Deathbloom Ritualist, which for three generic, a black and a green is a 3-5 elf warlock at rare. You can tap it to add X mana of any one color, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. This is a rare, but as we'll see, black green likes having creatures in the graveyard in general, so this fits in nicely in that deck. And as I just said, this format has lots of things to spend mana on, and this mana is actually more flexible than most of the ramp mana in the format. There are going to be times where you play this and there's nothing in your graveyard and it can't tap for mana, but a fail case of a 5 mana 3-5 could be worse, and there's also going to be times where this taps for a bunch of mana, allowing you to use a bunch of activated abilities or ramp into something really impressive. I'm giving this a B+. 
Next up, it's Evangel of Synthesis, which for a blue and a black is a 2-3 Phyrexian human cleric at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and then discard a card, and as long as you've drawn two or more cards this turn, it gets plus one plus zero and has menace. So blue-black is about drawing extra cards and getting value out of it, and that's what this does. It's a two mana 2-3 two, that loots when it enters the battlefield. That's already something you basically always play, so it's nice that it's both an enabler and a payoff for the draw extra cards deck. It is a little sad that it will technically trigger the turn you play it and it just won't matter. It just feels sort of underwhelming, even though it really isn't. I mean, it's a creature with good stats that brings you all kinds of value. I think this signpost uncommon is a B-. Next up, it's Falaji Vanguard, which for two generic, a red and a white, is a 2-3 human soldier at uncommon. It has first strike, and when it or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. So the turn this comes down, it will be able to offer a boost to something else most of the time, and most likely that boost is going to allow a creature to attack either that couldn't attack before or allows it to attack more effectively if it could already attack. And then after that, you can start using this ability to pump the Vanguard itself, which is going to be optimal since it has first strike. One really nice thing here is that it counts every individual creature that enters the battlefield. It doesn't say one or more, like some effects do, every single creature that enters the battlefield triggers this ability. So if you make multiple creatures, you cast two spells in a turn, or make three creature tokens in a turn, you get three triggers or, or two triggers, depending on how many you cast. So this thing, if you're allowed to untap and just like play a creature, your opponent basically will never be able to block it. And the turn it comes down, it gives you value right away. As usual, of course, red white is about going wide and attacking the opponent and Falaji Vanguard fits in great there. This is a B. Next up, it's Hajar, Loyal Bodyguard, which for a red and a green is a 3-3 legendary human soldier at rare. You can sacrifice it, and legendary creatures you control get plus and plus zero and gain indestructible until end of turn. This feels like a card they printed for Constructed, like Bard class in particular, because this set does not have that strong of a legendary theme. It actually has fewer legendaries in it than Dominaria United did, because the signposts on commons in this format are not legendary. There are legendary creatures around, even a few at Uncommon, but not really enough for this to really matter most of the time, so mostly it's just a 2-mana 3-3 and one that costs two different colors of mana, and that's not like an amazing card, you know, like in an aggro deck in Constructed, that's a lot better than it is in Limited because games tend to go longer, and if you draw this late, it's just, you know, not that impactful. It's never really bad, you know, a 3-3 is relevant all game long, but it's just not gonna be anything special either. I think it's just a C. Next up, it's Harbin Vanguard Aviator, which for a blue and a white is a 3-2 legendary human soldier at rare. It's got flying, and whenever you attack with five or more soldiers, creatures you control get plus and plus one and gain flying until end of turn. This has a great baseline as a two mana 3-2 flyer, and it slots perfectly into the blue-white deck in the format, which is a soldier deck. You really only need to trigger this once and it's going to win you the game, and it's not going to be simple to make that happen, but it isn't impossible either. And the fact is, you play a two-mana creature that is a very quick clock on your opponent. I mean, if this isn't dealt with, it can do a bunch of damage, even without any soldier friends around. I think this is a B. Next up, it's Hero of the Dunes, which for three generic, a white and a black, is a 3-2 human soldier at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you return target artifact or creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and creatures you control with mana value three or less get plus one, plus zero. So black-white's all about creatures with low mana values, and this is an impressive signpost uncommon because the set has lots and lots of those to go around. The stat line is bad, but everything else about this card is amazing. It directly reanimates a small creature to the battlefield. That on its own already has me pretty interested in the card. So the fact that it buffs all of your low mana value creatures, including one that it brings back, really has me excited. This is a signpost in common that I think really pulls you into its color pair. I'm giving it a B plus. Next up, it's Junkyard Genius, which for one generic, a black and a red, is a 2-2 human artificer at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you create a tapped Power Stone token. You can pay one generic, a black and a red, and sack a creature or artifact, another creature or artifact, and until end of turn, other creatures you control get plus one plus zero and gain Menace and Haste. As usual, Black Red has a sacrifice thing going on. This one feels sort of like Forgotten Realms, which was a few sets back. It can sacrifice creatures, but the creature can also sacrifice a plentiful artifact token resource in this set. Forgotten Realms, that was treasure. In this case, it's Power Stones. 
This brings a Power Stone to the table so you can use this ability without any extra help, and it's a pretty strong one. Plus one plus zero and Menace make a board a heck of a lot more imposing, and Haste even means sometimes it can send something in early, although I wouldn't count on doing that a ton because having three mana to spend after you cast a creature isn't always that doable, though with Power Stones around it's a little more doable. There's also plenty of other sacrifice support in the set. This doesn't have a great stat line, but it largely overcomes that to be a pretty nice signpost and common, giving it a B. Next up, it's Legions to Ashes, which for one generic, a white and a black, is a rare sorcery, and it says exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls, and all tokens that player controls with the same name as that permanent. This is a great removal spell. Three to deal with any non-land is a great deal, and sometimes you'll be able to use this to wipe out a bunch of soldier tokens or power stones. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Mishra, claimed by Gix, which for two generic, a black and a red, is a 3-5 legendary Phyrexian human artificer at Mythic Rare. When you attack, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life, where X is the number of attacking creatures. If Mishra, claimed by Gix, and a creature named Phyrexian Dragon Engine are attacking, and you both own and control them, exile them, then meld them into Mishra, lost to Phyrexia, it enters the battlefield tapped and attacking. So yeah, Meld is a thing in this set. It's not really here for Limited though, because this is a Mythic Rare and the other card you need for that Meld to matter is a Rare. Getting them both together, not only in play to begin with, but both in your draft or your sealed pool is highly unlikely, but then you also have to get them both in play at the same time. They both have to be attacking. It's just too many hoops to jump through when you can only have one copy of each of these in your deck, and you're not even close to guaranteed you'll have those. The good news is, Mitra has some solid stats and a very powerful attack trigger. Draining your opponent one life for every one of your attacking creatures is very strong, and you can play Mishra and take advantage of that right away, providing you can attack with some of your stuff. Gaining life while doing damage is a great way to turn games around. But yeah, don't count on melding this. But, you know, you're going to be first picking it anyway most of the time you see it. I don't quite think it reaches bomb status because it does need a board to be built to some extent to really do its job. But it gets close. I'm giving him a B+. Next up, it's Mishra, Tamer of Makfawa, which for three generic, a black and a red, is a 4-4 legendary human artificer at rare. Permanents you control have Ward, Sacrifice a Permanent, and each artifact card in your graveyard has Unearth for one generic, a black, and a red. This is a returning mechanic. I'll read it because we haven't seen it yet. It says, return the card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next instep, or if it would leave the battlefield, unearth only as a sorcery. So, a 5-mana 4-4 four four with this Ward ability is kind of okay, since it includes itself. Sure, your opponent can give up something meaningless sometimes, but that is something. Usually you'll get to two for one your opponent, even if one of the cards you're getting isn't that great. And sometimes they won't really have the means to kill this because they don't have spare permanence lying around. But the majority of this card's power comes from the fact that it gives all of your artifacts on Earth. And note that it's not just artifact creatures, it's all artifacts. So getting creatures back is usually going to give you more value because then the haste part actually matters. But sometimes you can bring artifacts back. There's a few artifacts in this set that, you know, have effects when they enter the battlefield or when you sacrifice them or whatever, and getting those back can be valuable too. This format has tons and tons of artifacts, so most of the time when you play Mishra, it's likely you have at least one thing in there, and if you have a well-stocked graveyard, he can really go crazy. I think this is a B+. Next up, it's Queen Kayla Bin Krug, which for one generic, a red and a white, is a 2-3 human noble at rare. You can pay four and tap her to discard all the cards in your hand, then draw that many cards. You may choose an artifact or creature card with mana value one you discarded this way, then do the same for artifact or creature cards with mana values two and three. Return those cards to the battlefield, activate only as a sorcery. So... This is a seriously powerful ability, as she can allow you to rummage away your whole hand and even put some of those cards back on the battlefield. That's amazing upside. Now, actually pulling this off, where you put some stuff directly into play, will not be that easy and limited. However, this format does have a few creatures and or artifacts with a mana value of one or two, so it will actually do something sometimes. And the fail case is still a three mana two three that can let you dig deeper into your library. And when you get to discard something, replace that card by drawing it, and then also put that card into play, it's gonna feel pretty good. It is sorcery speed, it does cost four mana, which is very clunky, 
But I do think there's enough upside here that is strong enough that I'm pretty interested in taking her relatively early. I'm giving her a B minus. It is hard to really pull this off, but the fail case isn't too bad. Next up, it's Sahili Filigree Master, who for two generic, a blue and a red is a legendary Planeswalker Sahili at Mythic Rare. She starts with three loyalty. Her plus one says scry one. You may tap an untapped artifact you control if you do draw a card. Her minus two says create two, one, one, colorless stop your artifact creature tokens with flying. They gain haste until end of turn. And her minus four says you get an emblem with artifact creatures you control get plus one plus one and artifact spells you cast cost one less to cast. So Sahili's a straight up bomb. Her minus two generates two nice bodies that can protect her. And you can also use them to pressure your opponent if she doesn't really need protecting. They also bring all sorts of extra synergy because they're artifacts themselves. And that includes with her other two loyalty abilities. Drawing with her plus one is going to be pretty easy to do in this format, even if you don't use her minus two first. And her ultimate will certainly have a big impact on the game. Again, especially if you used her minus two earlier on because those two thopters will become two twos and then all your other artifacts are also cheaper. So yeah, she can draw you cards, she protects herself effectively and she has a very reasonable ultimate that isn't that hard to get to. I think she's an A. Next up, it's Sorinthian Great Worm, which for four generic, a green and a red, is a 7-6 trampler. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, create a tapped power stone token. A 6-mana six 7-6 seven, six Trampler is a nice creature, and getting a Power Stone anytime you or your opponent plays a land is pretty great. Obviously, you probably aren't that desperate for mana by the time this Worm comes down, but as I've been saying, there are lots of places to spend Power Stone mana, and you're likely to have some of those. I think this is a B+. Next up, we have Skyfisher Spider, which for two generic, a black and a green is a 3-3 spider at Uncommon. It has Reach. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature. When you do, you destroy target non-land permanent. When Skyfisher Spider dies, you may gain one life for each creature card in your graveyard. If you do, exile Skyfisher Spider from your graveyard. So here's another very good signpost uncommon. Having a better version of Bone Splinters stapled to a 3-3 with Reach is quite the deal, especially in a color pair with expendable bodies and a reason to put creatures in the graveyard. The life gain this gives you can make a difference too. You don't always want to exile it, of course, especially if you're not gaining any life or anything or very little life, as there are ways in black, as usual, to get this back for value, and playing this again and getting that Enter the Battlefield ability again is usually gonna be better than gaining life, but there's tons of situations, you know, where this is gaining you upwards of five or six life, and you need that a little bit more, or you don't have a way to get it back or whatever. But either way, another really good signpost in common. I'm giving it a B. Thanos, the toy maker, which for three generic, a green and a blue is a three, five legendary human artificer at rare. Whenever you cast a beast or bird creature spell, you may copy it, except the copy is an artifact in addition to its other types. This is really sweet and has me interested in building an EDH deck around it, but unfortunately this format doesn't have a whole lot of beasts or birds in it. So successfully building around this isn't that easy and limited. You probably need two beasts or birds in your deck before you really wanna play this. And it's going to be difficult to end up with that many or many more than that in the first place. There are gonna be a lot of decks in this format that just don't have any beasts or birds in them. And obviously in a deck like that, it's an F. And because there aren't a plethora of common and uncommon beasts and birds in the format, I think the ceiling for this card is sadly just a C plus. It's a little sad they didn't just throw a couple more beasts and birds at lower rarities, but what are you gonna do? Next up, it's Third Path Iconoclast, which for a blue and a red is a 2-1 human monk at Uncommon. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token. I always love blue-red prowess as a deck, and this is an impressive payoff. It's basically a gold version of Young Pyromancer. It is harder to cast than the Pyromancer, but it also counts all non-creature spells and not just instants and sorceries. And keep that in mind in this set about blue and red in general, the payoffs almost all say non-creature spell, not instant or sorcery like we see in some sets. So this can generate an army and make all of your spells significantly better, giving it a B. Next up, it's Takasia Dig Sight Mentor, which for one generic, a green, a white, and a blue is a 4-3 human artificer at rare. Creatures you control have Vigilance and Tap Surveil 1 
to surveil one, look at the top card of your library. You may put that card into your graveyard. And then she has an ability she can use from the graveyard where you pay two generic, two green, two white, two blue, and exile her from your graveyard to return any number of target artifact creature cards with total mana value 10 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, activate only as a sorcery. So a four mana four three that gives all of your creatures vigilance and surveil one is a nice card, even if you have to spend three different colors of mana to cast it. Her graveyard ability is really powerful, but I wouldn't count on being able to fully utilize it by having enough artifacts in your graveyard and having the mana to cast it or use the ability, rather, all that often. Obviously, her surveil effect can help set that ability up, but most of the time, if you surveil and you see an artifact on top of your library, you probably just want to cast it rather than throw it into your graveyard and then hope Takasya dies at some point. So mostly you're just playing her, upgrading your creatures significantly, and maybe occasionally getting some value out of her graveyard ability. I'm giving her a B. Next up, it's Urza, Lord Protector, which for one generic, a blue and a white is a 2-4 legendary human artificer at Mythic Rare. Artifact, instant, and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast, and you can pay seven generic, and if you both own and control Urza, Lord Protector, and an artifact named the Might Stone and Weak Stone, exile them, then meld them into Urza Planeswalker. Activate only as a sorcery. Again, you're not really gonna end up melding. This is a Mythic Rare. The other card you need is a rare. One thing to keep in mind about all activated abilities in this format is that they're all gonna be a little easier to use because of power stones. So actually paying the seven mana here is gonna be easier than you might think, but actually having both of those permanents in play is not going to be so easy. So this is mostly a three mana two four that decreases the cost of a significant number of spells in your deck. That's a pretty good card, even without any of the meld stuff going on. I think this is a B. Next up, it's Urza, Prince of Krug, which for two generic, a white and a blue, is a 2-3 legendary human artificer at rare. Artifact creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and you can pay six generic and create a token that's a copy of target artifact you control, except it's a 1-1 soldier creature in addition to its other types. So artifact creatures are everywhere in this format. Even most creature tokens are artifacts, including the soldier tokens. So that plus two plus two boost won't be that hard to get significant advantage out of. And there's gonna be lots of times where you can play Urza. He makes your board better right away and you can attack. So that even if your opponent untaps and kills Urza, at least you got something out of him. And if they don't untap and kill Urza, you know, you can start sinking mana into this activated ability, which is quite powerful. The tokens are gonna be three threes as long as Urza stays in play but no matter what, you end up keeping some value behind by using the ability. And again, the ability will be a little easier to use than it might look at first because of the fact that there are power stones in the set. So yeah, I think this Urza sneaks into the lower bomb range. You know, in a lot of formats, this would be a little niche, something that you really have to build around. But I think if you're in the blue-white blue -white deck in this format, it's just gonna do the thing. And uh, yeah, so I'm giving it an A minus. Next up, it's Yodian Dissident, which for a green and a white is a 1-1 human artificer at uncommon, and whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus and plus one counter and target creature you control. So this counts artifacts coming into play in any way at all, and that includes Power Stones, which will really make this capable of stacking up a ton of counters. The downside is it dies to pretty much everything before you put some counters on it, and that is pretty rough, but this will generate a lot of value if it sticks around. I'm giving it a B minus. Next, there's Yodian Tactician, which for two generic, a white and a blue, is a 3-4 human soldier at uncommon, and other soldiers you control get plus one, plus one. As I've already said, there are lots of soldiers in this set, with blue-white being the color pair that's the most interested in them, and this is a nice lord that will buff much of your board when you're in the color pair. I'm giving it a B minus. So something to keep in mind about this set and in this set review is they have changed the way that set numbers worked, at least they have for this set, and cards that have identities of a particular color actually have a set number that corresponds to them actually being that color. And there are a few artifacts in the set that have multicolored identities. So we're going to talk about those now before we move ahead to looking at the entirely colorless artifacts in the set. This also means, by the way, that we'll be talking about artifacts that have particular monocolored identities when we talk about each individual color as we move through the set review this week. So if there's an artifact I don't talk about in this video, that's because it has neither a multicolored nor a colorless identity, and we'll be covering them later. 
Next up, there's Blade Coil Serpent, which for X and six generic mana is a 5-4 artifact creature serpent at Mythic Rare. When it enters the battlefield, for each two blue that was spent to cast it, you draw a card. And for each two black spent to cast it, each opponent discards a card. And for each two red spent to cast it, it gets plus and plus zero and gains trample and haste until end of turn. Having two mana of each Grixis color isn't going to line up perfectly most of the time in Limited, but the fact of the matter is, even if you can only make one of these triggers happen a single time, you're going to feel pretty good about what you're getting. So, you know, a 6 mana 5-4 that draws you a card, or a 6 mana 5-4 that makes your opponent discard a card, or a 6 mana 6-5 six with Trample and Haste are all cards you would always play in Limited, and the ceiling here is just insane, since you can trigger these things together and potentially do it multiple times. Like I said, you shouldn't count on lining things up perfectly, but I think getting two out of three of these going or triggering one of them twice is very doable, and at that point, you have a very powerful card. I think this sneaks into the lower bomb range. I'm giving it an A-. Next up, there's Clay Champion, which for X and four generic is a 2-2 Mythic Rare Construct. When it enters the battlefield, it does so with three plus and plus one counters on it for each two green spent to cast it, and it enters the battlefield and puts a plus one plus one counter on up to two target creatures for each two white spent to cast it. So if you pay four for this and just happen to have double green and double white, you're going to end up with a five five that puts two plus one plus one counters on your other creatures. If that's always what this could do, it would be a bomb. And the fact you can sink even more mana into it is pretty great. But we do have to acknowledge that sometimes you're going to cast this for four and not be able to pay double of both but you're still ending up with a pretty good card. Either a four mana two two that puts a plus and plus one counter on up to two target creatures or a four mana five five. And you know, that's pretty much the baseline. And then on top of all of that, you have a crazy ceiling where you can pump multiple mana into this to get these triggers more than once. I think this one also sneaks into the lower bomb range. I'm giving it an A minus. So with those artifacts that have a multicolored identity out of the way, let's move now to artifacts with a colorless identity. Next up, it's Aeronaut's Wings, which for two generic is a common artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one plus zero and has flying and it has equip two. Plus one plus zero and flying is enough to make a creature a problem for your opponent, just about any creature, even if two to play and two to equip is a little bit clunky. Keep in mind though, Power Stones make casting this and equipping it easier. I think this is a C. Next up, it's Argivian Avenger, which for six generic mana is a 5-5 artifact creature shapeshifter at uncommon. You can pay one generic, and until end of turn, it gets minus one, minus one, and gains your choice of flying, vigilance, death touch, or haste. This is a fun reference to lots of older cards with abilities that weaken their stats in order to gain keywords, but this isn't that great, even in a format where Power Stones will make casting it and using its ability easier. It has fairly underwhelming base stats, and while gaining keywords is nice and all, the fact that stats get worse when you do it doesn't have me that interested. I think this is just a C. Next up, it's Cityscape Leveler, which for eight generic is an artifact creature construct at Mythic Rare. It's an 8-8 Trampler, and when you cast it and whenever it attacks, you destroy up to one target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a tapped Power Stone token, Unearth 8. This costs a lot, but it won't be quite as hard to cast as it looks, thanks to Power Stones, and that's good because this thing is really powerful. Your opponent might get a Power Stone back, but destroying an on-land permanent on being cast and when it attacks is quickly going to become a problem, and it even comes with Unearth, so even if they do manage to deal with the thing, they're going to end up losing one more permanent. Keep in mind, Unearth doesn't count as casting, but it will be able to come back and attack. In most formats, something this costly wouldn't really be a bomb because the mana would be too challenging, there wouldn't be enough decks in the format capable of producing that amount of mana, but in this format, this is a bomb. Power Stones really change things. I'm giving this an A-. minus. Next up, it's Energy Refractor, which for two generic is a common artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and you can pay two to add one mana of any color. It's a good thing this replaces itself because it's pretty bad at filtering mana. We've seen Prophetic Prism in the past that was a similar card, except you paid one mana and tapped it to add one mana of any color, and that card is pretty good in formats with artifact themes. But two mana is obviously a lot more than one, even if you can use this more than once in a turn. But the format does care about artifacts and non-creature spells, and one that replaces itself has some inherent value, with the filtering part just some minor upside. I think this is a C-. 
Next up, it's Goblin Firebomb, which for one generic is a common artifact with flash, and you can pay seven and tap it and sacrifice it to destroy target permanent. We've seen cards like this before, and they are always pretty mediocre. It isn't efficient, even for destroying any permanent type. Now, the format does, of course, have this artifact theme, and if you can find ways to recur this, it starts to get a little interesting, but I'm still pretty low on it. I'm giving it a D+. You'll run it if you're desperate for removal. Next up, it's Levitating Statue, which for two generic is an uncommon artifact with flying. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you put a plus and plus one counter on it, and you can pay two generic to have it become a 1-1 construct artifact creature until end of turn. We've seen spell payoffs like this in the past, and they're always kind of underwhelming. This is because for much of the game, casting this seems like it didn't really accomplish anything. After all, it's just a hunk of metal on the battlefield until you pay mana to animate it, and that's a pretty big bummer, even in a world of power stones. Then you jump through hoops to make it grow, too. It is nice it can sort of sit around and accumulate counters before starting to threaten your opponent, and there are games where things will work out that way. But I think there will be times where casting this thing puts you behind the eight ball in a big way. I think this is just a C. Next up, it's Liberator Urza's Battle Thopter, which for three generic is a 1-2 legendary artifact creature Thopter. At rare, it has flash and flying. You may cast colorless spells and artifact spells as though they had flash. And whenever you cast a spell, if the amount of mana spent to cast that spell is greater than Liberator Urza's Battle Thopter's power, put a plus and plus one counter on Liberator. This is great. Format, of course, has tons of artifacts, so giving them all flash is very real upside, and the Liberator is just going to grow throughout the game without you really trying that hard. It isn't the kind of card that will win you the game immediately most of the time, but if it's allowed to stick around for a few turns, it will generate a ton of value for you. I'm giving this a B+. Next up, it's the Might Stone and Weak Stone, which for five generic mana is a rare legendary artifact power stone, and when it enters the battlefield, choose one. Draw two cards, or target creature gets minus five, minus five until end of turn, and you can tap it to add two colorless, but this mana can't be spent to cast non-artifact spells. This is the card that merges with Urza Lord Protector, who we saw earlier. This has a cool design. It's pretty clunky. It's a mana rock, after all, that costs five. But because it comes down and does something right away, it's easier to get past that problem. Now, neither option is going to feel that efficient. Five mana for minus five, minus five at sorcery speed, or to draw two cards is just not a rate you're normally into. But this does give you some additional relevant value simply by being an artifact and being an artifact payoff because of the mana it can produce. And there's tons of sweet things to ramp into using Power Stone mana in the format. One kind of cool thing, even though the Urza Lord Protector thing probably isn't going to happen, is that you can tap this and use the mana from it to pay for Urza Lord Protector's ability. So if you do have both of these in play, you really only need five lands or so to use that ability because this can tap for two. But most of this card's value just comes from the fact that it comes down and kills something or draws you a card and then ramps your mana. And that's a pretty good card. I'm giving it a B. Next up, it's Mine Worker, which for two generic is a 2-1 artifact creature assembly worker at common. You tap it to gain one life, and if you control creatures named Power Plant Worker and Tower Worker, you gain three life instead. So there's a fun cycle of cards in this set that reference the old Urza lands. There are all these little assembly workers who have an activated ability that gets better if you control all three of them. And that's what we're seeing here. So... This one's not amazing. You know, if the format had a life gain deck, it would be way better. As it is, it's fairly mediocre as it has poor stats and an ability that usually won't do enough to feel like you're getting there. Obviously, if you can get the Tron going here, you're going to be happier. But even with all three at common, don't count on that happening all the time. I think this is a C minus. Next up, it's Portal to Phyrexia, which for nine generic mana is a mythic rare artifact. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices three creatures. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. It's a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. So this costs a ton of mana, but like with Cityscape Leveler, this is going to be easier cast than it looks. And it's well worth the nine mana. Forcing the opponent to lose three creatures can be pretty sweet, of course, though sometimes by the time you're at nine mana, the effect might be minimal. However, on your next turn, you get to start reanimating something every single turn, and it's likely that the Enter the Battlefield ability on this card has allowed you to ensure that you'll be able to get some creatures back. In short, I think ramping into this is doable. It impacts the board immediately, and on subsequent turns, it just snowballs value. And even though it costs nine mana, in this format, it's a straight up bomb. I'm giving it an A. Next up, it is Power Plant Worker, which for five generic mana is a 4-4 artifact creature assembly worker at common. You can pay three generic and it gets plus two plus two until end of turn. And then if you control 
creatures named Mine Worker and Tower Worker, you put two plus and plus one counters on Power Plant Worker instead. Activate only once each turn. So here is the Power Plant Assembly Worker. This one I think is a little bit better. A five mana four four that can buff its power for three mana is a solid card. Again, you can use Power Stones to pay for that ability, so it's gonna be feeling a little bit cheaper than the three mana you see here. And this one does get a pretty impressive upgrade in a world where you actually get all three in play because, you know, the buff is permanent. I think this is a C. Next up, it's Reconstructed Thopter, which for three generic is a 2-1 artifact creature Thopter at Uncommon. It's got Flying and Unearthed too. So these days, a three mana 2-1 flyer isn't very good on its own. It's probably like a D plus, but this comes with the upside of an important card type and Unearthed, which certainly allows you to generate some serious value, either simply by attacking or bringing it back, getting a trigger because an artifact entered the battlefield and or then sacrificing it. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Slag Stone Refinery, which for four generic is an uncommon artifact, and when it or another non-token artifact you control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield or is put into exile from the battlefield, create a tapped Power Stone token. Even in a set with a sacrifice theme going on, which we saw is there in Black Red, this doesn't feel very good. Four mana is a ton for something that won't do much for at least a turn, and while the format does have a sacrifice deck, it just feels like you're spending too much mana for minimal upside. There are much better ways to produce Power Stones in the format. Now, this does have, I think, some potential to kind of be an insane engine in a deck that can sacrifice artifacts over and over again. But the bummer is you can't do it with Power Stones because it says non-token artifacts. So you don't create a chain like you sort of could with a card like Oni Cult Anvil. You have to be giving up real artifacts or having them die or whatever to get value out of this. And I'm not sure the value is enough. I'm starting this at a D. Next up, it's Spectrum Sentinel, which for one generic is a 1-2 artifact creature soldier at Uncommon. It has protection from multicolored, and whenever a non-basic land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, you gain one life. This isn't very good for limited. Multicolored is not a huge theme in the format, as you saw by the fairly limited number of multicolored cards in this video, and non-basic lands aren't all over the place either. This is not Dominaria United. Mostly, you're going to be getting a 1-mana one 1-2. One now, it is both an artifact and a soldier, so in decks that care about those things, it isn't a complete disaster to play, but you're still kind of hoping you don't, giving it a D. Next up, it's the Stasis Coffin, which for three generic is a rare legendary artifact. You can pay two and tap it and exile it, and you gain protection from everything until your next turn. It's pretty cool to see the words protection from everything on a card again, but this doesn't feel very good for limited. It is a glorified fog effect, and fogs are basically never good in limited. You spend a card to have no real impact on the board, only delaying the inevitable in most cases. You'd much rather just have a three mana creature. In some ways, it's even worse than a fog because you can't even get it going as a surprise your opponent will know it's coming. Now, it's also better than fogs in some ways, like it can stop effects that target you, but that's just not enough. You're gonna give up a card here and you're not gonna get a card back most of the time. This is an F. Next up, it's Steel Exemplar, which for five generic is a 4-4 artifact creature wizard and uncommon, it has Trample, and it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it unless two or more colors of mana were spent to cast it. This is going to be easier to play as a 6-6 Trampler than you might think, once again, because of Power Stones. Obviously, most limited decks are two colors, so your mana base probably can't support doing this all on its own, but if you have like two Power Stones in play, it becomes much easier to cast this as a larger creature, and the fail case isn't the worst thing ever. I think this is a C+. Next up, it's the Stone Brain, which for two generic is a rare legendary artifact. You can pay two and tap it and exile it. You choose a card name, search target opponent's graveyard hand and library for up to four cards with that name and exile them. That player shuffles, then draws a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. Activate only as a sorcery. As usual, this is an unplayable effect in Limited. You generally don't have the necessary knowledge of your opponent's deck to take full advantage of a card like this, and even when you do, it still isn't very good most of the time, especially because this version even lets your opponent draw a card if you hit a card in their hand. Even if you do end up hitting a card in your opponent's deck, you're basically going to feel like you mulliganed, since hitting one card in your opponent's deck just doesn't do enough in Limited. Basically, you go down a card for no real effect, and you never want that in Limited. This is a card that makes sense in Constructed, where it can rip apart a combo deck, but that's just not a thing in Limited. We've seen effects like this dozens of times at this point, and they're always an F.
Next up, it's Stone Retrieval Unit, which for four generic is a 2-3 artifact creature construct at common. When it enters the battlefield, you create a tapped Power Stone token. The rate here is not amazing, but it is one card that adds two artifacts to the board, and that definitely matters in this set, as do Power Stones. I think this is a C. Next up, it is Su Chi Cave Guard, which for eight generic is an 8-8 artifact creature construct at uncommon. It has Vigilance, it has Ward 4, and when it dies, you add eight colorless. Until end of turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. This is a very impressive thing to ramp into with your Power Stones. It's huge, hard to kill, and can play offense and defense. Plus, if it dies, it gives you a whole bunch of mana, and this format has a decent number of mana sinks around. Still, sometimes that mana won't matter, but that's fine with me. This is really the premier lower rarity ramp payoff in the format. I think this is a B. Next, it's Supply Drop, which for three generic is a common artifact. It has Flash, and when it enters the battlefield, target creature you control gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. You can pay four and tap it and sacrifice it to draw a card. This is a pretty interesting design. Three mana for a plus two, plus two trick isn't great, but you can cash it in for a card later, giving it some real two for one potential in a format that, of course, also cares that this is an artifact. I think this is a C. Next up, it's Swift Gear Drake, which for five generic mana is a two, four artifact creature Drake at common. It's got flying and haste, and when it enters the battlefield, put up to one target card from a graveyard on the bottom of its own library. Five mana for a 2 fourth flying in haste isn't amazing, but it isn't the worst rate ever either. It's probably like a D plus, so the end of the battlefield upside here is a thing. You can get rid of some graveyard action your opponent might have, or you can put a card on the bottom of your library that you want to draw later, but the bottom of your library is pretty far away, so I think you're going to get more utility out of this by hating on your opponent's graveyard. It's still probably not much more than a D+. Next up, it's Symmetry Matrix, which for four generic mana is an uncommon artifact. And whenever a creature with power equal to its toughness enters the battlefield under your control, you can pay one generic, and if you do, draw a card. This is a build around that will work out sometimes, but this format doesn't have a heavy symmetry theme going on. The one place where it works the best is probably the Soldier deck, because all of its Soldier tokens will trigger this. But, you know, you need seven or more cards that can trigger the Matrix for it to be worth it, and the fact you pay four and don't add to the board is always pretty rough. It's probably just an F in your typical deck in the format, and a C plus if you get there on Synergy and Symmetry. Next up, it's Thran Power Suit, which for two generic is an uncommon artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one for each aura and equipment attached to it and has ward two, and it can equip for two. On its own, this is two mana to play and two to equip, and it grants plus one plus one and ward two. That's probably a D plus or a C minus. Ward two is a nice thing to have as it makes your investment in equipping it feel a little less painful. There are auras and equipment around in the set, but not so many that I think this is much better than a C minus. Next up, there's Thran Spider, which for three generic is a 2-4 artifact creature spider at rare. It's got reach. When it enters the battlefield, you and target opponent each create a tapped Power Stone token, and you can pay seven generic and look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal an artifact card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this starts with solid stats, and it ramps your mana. It does also help your opponent out too with a Power Stone, and they'll be able to use theirs much sooner than you can use yours, since they get to untap it on their turn. However, I think the Spider's ability can really make up for that, since it will be able to draw you a card almost every time you use it in this format, and your Power Stones can help pay for it. I think this is a B. And our last colorless artifact before we move on to the lands is Tower Worker, which for three generic is a 1-3 artifact creature assembly worker at common. It has reach and you can tap it to add colorless. If you control creatures named Mine Worker and Power Plant Worker, add three colorless. So ramp is a real thing in this format, as I'm sure you've gathered from this video. So this will certainly be seeing some play. Getting the other two assembly workers in play at the same time is of course also sweet, but you know, don't count on it. I think this is a C. The first land is Argoth Sanctum of Nature, which is a rare land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary green creature. You can tap it for green, and for two generic and two green, you create a 2-2 two, two green bear creature token and mill three cards, activate only as a sorcery, and this melds with the green card we'll see later in the week, but again, you know, meld doesn't matter that much in limited. So this will enter tapped most of the time, but the ability to generate creature tokens, it's a big deal, as it lets this land add to the board in a very real way. Green-black decks in the format also like milling themselves, so you'll actually be able to get some value out of that. For what it's worth, it'll also help you transform this if you ever do actually meld it, because the card it melds with checks for cards in the graveyard. But mostly you're just going to be playing this to make bear tokens and mill yourself for value. 
And that's a lot of value for a card that only takes up a land slot. I think it's a B minus. Next up, it's Blast Zone, a rare land that enters the battlefield with a charge counter on it. You can tap it for colorless and you can pay XX and put X charge counters on it. And you can pay three and sack it to destroy each non-land permanent with mana value equal to the number of blast or charge counters on Blast Stone, Blast Zone. This is a reprint and pretty nice utility land. Unlike most lands, it can have a very real impact on the board. It does take some time to set up, but the fact your land can be something of a removal spell and sometimes even a bit of a sweeper is pretty darn nice. Also, it's going to be easier to use this ability than it was in War of the Spark because in this set, you have power stones. I think this is a B minus. Next up, it's Demolition Field, an uncommon land that you can tap for colorless. You can pay two, tap it, and sack it to destroy target non-basic land and opponent controls. That land's controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, then shuffle. You may search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. So this is basically Field of Ruin, and that's a card that just isn't worth running in Limited. It can sort of fix your mana, but this format doesn't have so many non-basic lands that you can count on that consistently, and your opponent gets some help too. It isn't good for your mana base, and it has an ability that is near useless in most limited formats. That's an F. Next up, it's Evolving Wilds, a common land. You can tap it and sack it to search your library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. See this all the time, and it's always a nice way to fix your mana. It allows you to run one basic land of a given type, and those two things are all you need to splash a powerful card. And even in a two-color deck, it tends to make your mana better. I think this is a C+. Next up, it's Fortified Beachhead, which is a rare land. As it enters the battlefield, you may reveal a soldier card from your hand. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you reveal the soldier card this way, or you control a soldier, and you can tap it to add white or blue, and you can pay five and tap it, and soldiers you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. This is going to be pretty sweet if you're in blue-white. Soldiers are plentiful in that color pair, meaning you can have it enter untapped a reasonable chunk of the time, and the fact it can buff your soldiers is nice too. It isn't exactly efficient at doing it, but it's a nice ability to have on a card that's also doing a reasonable job for you in terms of producing mana. I think this is a C+. Next up, it's Hall of Togsin, a rare land. You can tap it for colorless. You can pay one and tap it to add one mana of any color, and you can pay four and tap it to create a tapped Power Stone token. Filter lands, if that's all they are, aren't usually good in most formats as the cost of producing mana is just too high, but I think the added ability to make Power Stone certainly matters here as Power Stone ramp decks are legit in the format. You can even use Power Stones to help you filter the mana here. I think this is a C+. Next up, it's Mishra's Foundry, which is a rare land. You can tap it for colorless. For two mana, it becomes a 2-2 assembly worker artifact creature until end of turn. It's still a land. You can pay one and tap it, and target attacking assembling worker gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. Creature lands are good, and that's certainly the case here. It does hurt your mana a little to play this, but this is largely a two-color format, so it's not going to hurt you that much. And it's certainly worth taking the small hit to your mana base. It's a land that can become a creature. It's like gaining a card of value, since most lands can never give you anything but mana. As we've seen, there's also assembly workers in the set. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Tokasia's Dig Site, a common land that you tap for colorless, and you can pay three generic and tap it to surveil one. This isn't great for your mana, but having a repeatable source of surveil is going to be worth it in some decks because it can both load your graveyard and improve your card quality. Three mana is a lot, and that's an ability you'll only be using when you have nothing better to do, but hey, again, Power Stones will make it a little easier. I think this is a C-. Lastly, we have four pain lands in the set, like Battlefield Forge here. It's a rare land. You can tap it for colorless, or you can tap it for one of two other colors, and it does one damage to you. These do a good job of fixing your mana for you. They're actually going to be better here than they were in Dominaria United, because this format doesn't have domain and a cycle of common dual lands that are basically just better. These will do a good job of fixing your mana, giving them a C+. So those are my thoughts on all the multicolored and colorless cards in the Brothers War. Tomorrow I'll be back with all my thoughts on the white cards. If you enjoyed this video and it helped you out, consider liking it and sharing it so others can see it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of this set review, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you're watching this when there are more videos in the series out, you should see the playlist shortly. Lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and the channel, you can do that by becoming a patron, buying Need to Hone merch, or becoming a channel member. You can find ways to do all of those things in the description. Thanks for watching.